Welcome to Man Medicine, where we talk about optimizing your health and avoiding the collapsing U.S. healthcare system. So today's little talk is going to be part of a series that I'm going to do on male fertility, which I know many of you guys may not be interested in, but I do have a, a subset of my patient population that uh, has fertility concerns, and so this is something that I want to that I do want to address at least periodically. And what I want to talk with you about today is a list of FDA approved medications that have been shown to actually negatively impact male fertility in a variety of different ways. Um, we're going to cover this article here uh, by the OncoTarget Journal, it's a 2017 article. Now OncoTarget, as you can probably guess from the name, is actually a cancer journal. Um, but for whatever reason, they um, decided to publish this article, and it's titled FDA Approved Medications That Impair Human Spermatogenesis. So <clears throat> we're going to go through some of the major medication classes that they talk about in this article. And we're not going to cover all of them because this is actually a pretty lengthy article. And, um, you know, so again, this is not going to be a comprehensive look at every single medication that could Im impact uh, male fertility, but just some of the major ones. So let's start, let's get right to it. Um, right off the bat, the first one that they mention, they talk about antibiotics. And most antibiotics don't seem to have much effect on male fertility, but there's one in particular called uh, nitroferentoin. Uh, the other name for it is macrobid. And I use a fair amount of this in the emergency room. It's uh, first line for women for like uncomplicated urinary tract infections, but it does get used in men. Sometimes it's used in men who have recurrent UTIs. And so they'll use it on a daily basis at a low dose. Um, just as like as a preventative. So for example, my dad who's had bladder cancer is 88 years old. He takes Macrobit every single day. Obviously he's not worried about his sperm counts <laughs> at this age, at least I don't think he is. Um, so this is not a big deal necessarily. If, if you're just taking a five to seven day course of uh, Macrobit, you don't necessarily need to worry about your sperm counts. If for whatever reason you're on it uh, for a long period of time on a daily basis, like as a preventative, you know, I, that could potentially could be an issue. Um, and so it does, uh, it does impair the development of sperm. It uh, lowers counts. It seems to affect, uh, you know, DNA damage or the repair of DNA damage potentially to sperm cells. There's also some data that erythromycin, um, which is a very commonly used antibiotic, it's been around forever, might have similar effects. So again, I don't think you need to worry about this if you're just doing a short term course of antibiotics, which you know most, most of the time that's what you're doing. If you're on these drugs chronically, months and months, I see you know potential there that uh, this could be you know potentially an issue. So the next class of drugs that they cover is antidepressants, and not surprisingly, it's the SSRIs. Now we know that SSRIs have adverse effects on male sexual function in terms of libido, uh, in terms of uh, erectile dysfunction, but they may also have some problems when it comes to uh, to sperm counts. So there's one in particular, Paroxetine or, or Paxil which uh, again, very commonly used, but some of the other ones too have some data that show they could be problematic. So things like Prozac and Celexa, Zoloft, those sorts of things. The data is not quite as good on those, but Paxil for sure. It definitely lowers sperm quality. Um, it causes DNA fragmentation. So you might have more mutant sperm, more likely to have um, mutations. And uh, in one particular study that they cited, there was a, um, so in men that took Paxil, there was a, 35% of them suffered a decrease in sperm counts and a decrease in sperm quality versus like 13.8% they said in the control group. So there, there seems to be something going on there. And obviously SSRIs are not something that you take uh, for a very brief period of time in most cases. These are things that you're gonna be on for months or years. So Paxil in particular, be aware of that. If you're on one of the other ones and you're trying to conceive a child, you know, bottom line is you need to get a sperm analysis done and kind of see where you're at. But, you know, if your counts are low, your mortality is poor, there seems to be a lot of uh, damaged, you know, mutant sperm, and you're on one of these drugs, talk to your doctor and see if maybe there's some alternatives for you. Now, the next class of drugs that they mention is uh, antihypertensive drugs, and in particular, calcium channel blockers. The one that they seem to single out that has the most data on it is nifedipine or Procardia or Adelat or the other generic names for it. Um, doesn't get used a ton anymore. I remember prescribing this back in the day. 
Uh, it does get used in the obstetric world uh, periodically, but the concern I have with this um, is that it may spill over and affect other calcium channel blocker drugs. We do know that diltiazem is, is one of the ones that um, also seems to be affected in addition to uh, nifedipine, but I couldn't find much data on the other calcium channel blockers. So whether this is unique to those two drugs or whether this is a class effect, I can't tell you for sure. I, I would be a little bit concerned that it could be a class effect. The interesting thing about these calcium channel blockers is it's not so much that they lower sperm counts or sperm quality, although there's some data that it does that, but it actually can prevent the sperm from uh, properly fertilizing the egg. So presumably there's some calcium channels involved in that process that potentially could be blocked by, by these drugs. So um, calcium channel blockers are used very commonly. I prescribe them all the time. They've got a pretty good side effect profile, especially if you're a younger person. But um, again, if, if you've got questionable semen parameters on your analysis and you're on a calcium channel blocker, may want to consider discontinuing or talking with your doc about putting you on like an angiotensin receptor blocker, something like that, that at least as far as we know, does not affect sperm quality or fertility. Um, steroids, of course. So I'm not going to touch anabolic steroids and testosterone. Clearly those impair fertility like, drastically, but also corticosteroids do. So things like prednisone, dexamethasone, um, you know, all those, all those kind of uh, steroid drugs, you know, the anti-inflammatory drugs um, do as well. Again, you know, I prescribe these like crazy out of the emergency department for different conditions, but they're always for short periods of time. So, you know, you come in with an asthma exacerbation, your COPD is flaring up, you know, you're probably going to get five days, maybe a little bit longer of, uh, of prednisone or dexamethasone, something like that. Um, so I wouldn't really worry about it if it's just a short pulse, but if you're on chronic steroids, which, you know, there, there is a large number of different conditions that require um, someone to be on steroids, usually autoimmune problems. And again, you're trying to conceive, that could be a problem. It's gonna throw off your whole hypothalamic pituitary axis. It's gonna mess with your testosterone levels. It's absolutely, it's gonna mess with your with your sperm count. So um, again, you know, if you're on chronic prednisone, it's usually because you have something very serious going on and it's not the sort of thing that you should stop abruptly. In fact, that could be uh, disastrous if you do that. So just make sure, if you want to come off of those medications, you talk to your talk to your doctor about it because it actually can be dangerous. You want to do a very slow wean when you come off of a prolonged course of corticosteroids. The other one um, that they mention is a medicine for gout called colchicine. I don't use a ton of colchicine in, in my practice, uh, but I have used it in the past for gout flares. Um, you know, again, this is more for chronic chronic use. So again, I, I wouldn't worry too much about that. Uh, but if you have gout, you're taking colchicine on a regular basis, it definitely could have an impact. Um, a big one is the DHT blockers, so finasteride, dutesteride. So younger men take these a lot for hair loss, right? Older men take them for prostatic hypertrophy, but they're used cosmetically for hair loss at, at a much lower, like, you know, daily dose. And um, certainly can have an impact on, on both sperm counts, uh, semen volume goes down significantly on these drugs and then uh, sperm motility so you know if, if you're trying to conceive a child you've got to have to make a decision do I want to keep my hair do I want to have a baby you know what do I want to do <laughs> uh, but th that can be a serious problem okay um, ED drugs now, I didn't know this actually I learned this from this article but Tadalafil which is Cialis is associated with lower sperm counts so again, I would assume that this is, and they didn't mention this in the article, um, but it's probably like chronic daily use of, of Tadalafil or Cialis. So there's like a five milligram daily dose that men can take. It works fabulously. Um, you, you may not get, it may not be an issue if you use like the PRN, you know, as needed 20 milligram dose. But, you know, again, the, the studies are not really clear on it. And, you know, to be perfectly frank, the studies that they mentioned were on in animals, so I don't know, you know. It, I guess you can check, you know, but just just be aware of that I didn't see any data on any of the other ED drugs, um, so you know Viagra, etc. So you know, it could be a class effect. It might be something unique about uh, Tadalafil. So I don't I don't really know. And then finally, um, the one that they cover in here is alpha blockers. So. They use alpha blockers generally for prostatic hypertrophy, 
Uh, they help men with large prostates urinate. Again, most m people that men that have you know large prostates, these are older men. They don't really care about fertility. It's not really an issue. But you know, there are in some cases where younger men are put on them. I, I use them in the emergency room occasionally um, to facilitate uh, kidney stone passage. If you're passing a stone, there's some data. I agree, it's not great uh, that um, you know if you're passing a kidney stone that putting you on something like Flomax, which is um, uh, tamsulosin could, uh, you know, potentially make you pass a stone a little earlier. So again, you know, if you're on 10 days of this stuff to pass a kidney stone, I wouldn't worry about it. If you're on it every single day, uh, for a prostate issue, you know, that, th that could definitely be a problem. And the way that it's a problem is it causes retrograde ejaculation. So instead of your ejaculate going the direction it should go, goes the other direction. And so um, men can have, you know, up to 90% of men that are on that medication can have a significant decline in their semen volume, which obviously is gonna limit the amount of sperm that actually gets deposit, deposited in the vagina and potentially, you know, drastically lower your chances of conceiving a child. So um, anyway, that's a short list. Um, I got interested in this subject um, a couple of years ago when um, my girlfriend and I started doing, uh, started the process of doing uh, IVF so that we could conceive and I'm happy to say that we've been successful. So I looked into this, um, I was not on any of these, on any of these particular meds um, and so, uh, you know, it wasn't an issue for me, but there are a lot of men that do take these meds and so if you have low sperm counts to begin with, which again, I, I think I've mentioned this in other videos, this is a major problem in, in the Western world. It's a major problem probably globally, but men's sperm counts, as we know, are starting to decline. So if you already have borderline sperm counts or low quality sperm, and then you throw in one of these potential, you know, one of these medications and potentially, you know, that could mean the difference between you conceiving and not conceiving. So. You know, I hate to say it, it's embarrassing. You got to go, if you're going to go, if you want to have a baby as a male these days and you're having trouble, things are not happening as quickly as they should, you need to go get a semen analysis and just get an idea of, of what your counts are. And then, you know, if you've got great counts, then don't worry about it. But if they're low or borderline, you know, get with your doctor. Obviously, see if you're on one of these medicines. And by the way, like I said, this is not an all-inclusive list. There are other medicines out there that could potentially be causing this, but you know, if you've already got a low count, you don't want to do anything to lower them any further, especially if you can find some kind of an alternative. So that's all I have for you guys today. Those of you out there trying to knock up your wives and your girlfriends, uh, I hope you find this helpful and I wish you best of luck. I'll catch you next time. All Man Medicine video and audio has been created and shared online for informational purposes only. This podcast does not constitute the practice of medicine or professional healthcare services of any kind, including the giving of medical advice. I am not your doctor. No doctor-patient relationship has been established. This content is not meant to be a substitute for professional medical advice and should not be relied upon solely for that purpose either. The only purpose of this content is to present peer-reviewed, research-backed health information for your consideration. As always, rely on the advice and guidance of your personal physician before undertaking any activity presented here, and if in doubt or not comfortable with said activity, practice discretion. Your health is your responsibility and not ours. Finally, I take conflicts of interest seriously. I accept no compensation whatsoever from any private corporations, including pharmaceutical or supplement companies. You can trust that if I recommend a medication, product, or service, it's because I genuinely believe in it and not because I'm being paid to endorse it.